Xenoblade 3. I couldn't contain my excitement the day my copy arrived. After 100%ing Xenoblade 1 and 2, I was fully prepared to go on this journey. A magical journey to find the legendary Xenoblade, of course. However, the journey ended up being something I couldn't have possibly imagined. Hey, Flyan here, and I got a fun little video for you today, recounting my experience with Xenoblade 3. So let's get started. Listen, I didn't want just any old Xenoblade experience. I wanted to experience this like a Giga Chat, alright? Now, what did that entail exactly? Well, 100%ing the entire game and beating it solely on hard mode, of course. I'm sure I won't regret my decision at any point in my journey. I am immune to my own hubris. Well, how does the game start? With war, of course. Kevis versus Agnes. Soldiers indoctrinated at birth, warring with each other to extend their flame clocks to survive. They're born with only 10 years to live. And they're created in these, like, fetus pods. Where have I seen this before? A little different than the opening of the previous game where he just eats a crab. He eats a crab on top of a freak version of the boat from Wind Waker that he lovingly refers to as Gramps. Those were the good old days. Sunny skies and the salvager's code. Rule five of the salvager code. Get laid without a condom and you could get yourself messed up. Anyways, I'm definitely getting the tone for this game down. Things are pretty depressing in this world. I got sent straight to the battlefield to test out this game's combat and it was pretty fun. The music and the war going on in the background definitely pumped me up. And before getting the chance to get accustomed to this cast of characters, boom, bath scene. I braced myself. This caught me off guard. A bath scene? So soon. Xenoblade, uh, you've done it again. And it was surprisingly tame, actually. Kind of solidified their camaraderie in a cool way. Hey, they only got 10 years to live. They ain't got time to think about booba. I ain't gonna lie, though. They had me in the first half. I've been acclimated to different kinds of hot tub scenes from the previous game. Anyways, copy pastas aside, I was getting accustomed to our little colony. We got a big old machine called the Pharonis that's just chillin'. We feed it some souls of the living, you know the usual. That's how we do it around these parts. And this place is called Colony 9, like Colony 9 from Xenoblade 1. Holy crap, Lois. I feel like we're gonna see a lot of references like that in this game, yeah? I'm starting to like our emotional himbo lands and our bad bitch uni. Riku the Chad and rounding it off with our soft-spoken flute-playing main character Noah. Oh, and of course, Mwamba. Lovable, sweet Mwamba. My beautiful prince. So far, we got a good cast. Also, I gotta mention the interesting dialogue choices. Instead of swearing, they're saying, what the spark? I can't snuffing believe this, and Queen's Beans, I shit myself, or something like that. Hear that Noah? I dig it. At this point, I am utterly impressed by the game visually, on top of the insane combat music bangers it's been hitting me with. But oh, it's only just begun. Wait, 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 before I go any further, this is a good time to tell you guys that I'll be talking about my experiences in the entire game, which means there will be story spoilers, so if you are beware, you're in for a scare. At this point in the game, we get a little mission. There's some funky stuff going down, and both the Kevis and Agnes are fighting. And of course, we gotta go figure out what's going down. And what do we see when we get there? Van Damme crashing the mobile artillery and gunning down everyone. Wait, Van Damme? You're telling me a guy named Van Dan, the same as the last game, with the same pompadour and voice actor, is here to die tragically? It can't be. And of course, we're introduced to Mr. Wild Ride. I'm not gonna lie, this guy was intimidating as hell, standing 12 feet tall with a goddamn eight ball in his goofy ass stomach. It was kind of spooky. I didn't want to play billiards. I totally forgot to mention, we're introduced to the Agnes side of our cast, Mio the Offseer, Tyon, and Senna. We didn't have much time to be enemies because of old eight ball back there. Well, before old Van Dan croaked, he gave us the power of the Ouroboros. Say it out loud with me. Ouroboros. 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 Anyways, we get some of the coolest looking forms here. We get Bobo oh. from Xeno Gears, uh, uh, Gloombus, and Daft Punk Succubus. And so we kick the shit out of Wild Ride. We send this guy leaving with his tail between his legs, and the climax of chapter one ends. Well, to be honest, in hard mode, I barely beat the fight, but let's not worry about the little details here. Van Dam tells Bring us we're the hope beer. of the future, and to head to a city in Sword March, which is a big-ass sword, which used to be a big-ass sword held by a big-ass titan, but now it's just a big-ass sword. Maybe we'll find the Xenoblade there. Maybe that is the Xenoblade. Goodbye. He turns into clothing and refuses to elaborate further. So we got spooky bad guys in capes who are behind the scenes here. One of them looks like Graf from Xenogears, so I know I'm in for some crazy shit. 
But to me, they mostly look like jesters. Some goofy-ass clowns. We're introduced to some Zed guy who seems like the main baddie, and his voice is Ooh. sexy, so he's distracting. I am then immediately introduced to Lance and Senna sharing one brain cell. This is some mesmerizing movement. I mean, seriously, after all that crazy stuff happening, and this being the first thing to see was a great way to cleanse my palate. Tyon isn't really hmm. taking a liking to this whole journey thing with his new party members, but I'm sure he'll come around eventually. We found out Mio only has a couple of months before her time is up. I'm Nothing like some impending doom to spice up an adventure. I can tell this game is winding up to tear at my heartstrings. One day, we gotta take Mio to the vet one last time. We get introduced to a big wide open zone to run around in, and I am down. I'm enjoying my ability to swap between classes. I like how they exchange their little outfits when they do so. The combat at this point is definitely growing on me. As I roam this area and get destroyed by the unique monsters, I saw something beautiful in the distance. There I was, mesmerized. The giant beautiful monkey, gracefully walking through the plains in his enormous glory. My good friend Rotbar. I've seen him and fought him in every Xenoblade game. Like an old training partner and friend. We've laughed together, cried together, and made memories together. As I went to greet him like an old friend, I was completely appalled and utterly shocked. The territorial Rotbart I knew was now called Jingoistic Gigantus. I couldn't believe this. How could they have done this? This isn't the lovable monkey I knew. I turned away from him. The Rotbart I knew was dead. Anyways, we get introduced to one of the dopest characters, and that is Silvercoat Ethel. But she kind of wants us dead because she's being controlled by the uh, circus clowns. But we fought some sense into her and now she's on our side. One of the clowns Good. wasn't too fond of that and we got into one of the craziest fights in the game so far against Morbius. They're called Mobius, but I can't help myself. The chanting choir in the back, the big beefy freak looming in front of us, it was an insane fight. I was popping off. In terms of hard mode though, I was getting my ass kicked. The difficulty was definitely catching up to me, but I did get the job done. However, some grinding was in order for the future. Also, apparently Noah's Monado-looking ass sword was actually a sheath, and he had a secret god weapon hidden underneath that can cut the flame clock to stop Morbius from getting Who power. Is he? Anyway, we send this goofy fella to the pits of hell. Goodbye, Michael Morbius. What I thought would be another shortish chapter ended up being the chapter that I spent dozens of hours sinking into. The areas are so damn big in this game, and there's so much to do and explore. I was wandering around the goddamn Danag Desert like I was looking for some water. Seriously, this is the moment I felt like the game really opened up. I learned how to make my eye go shiny and chain attack a rotating enemy for 12 minutes so I can get a bunch of experience and class points. I ended up meeting some heroes to join my party. We have Grey with the dual guns. I like him a lot. He speaks only in grunts. Huh. And who could forget the illustrious Garbulio Jr. to aid us on our quest. And finally, Alexandria, who was the hardest to obtain because I had to be a super high level to do her quest in hard mode. But her class is kind of cracked, so it was totally worth it. Despite being only at Chapter 3, I got myself to level 50. Partially from grinding, but mostly from just doing all the side quests. Again, level 50 at Chapter 3, ladies and gentlemen. Ooh. I'm getting beefed up. Something interesting I learned in this chapter is that no pawn don't adhere to the 10 year lifespan or the laws of the flame clock. I saw no pawn on the affinity chart that's 39 years old. What the hell is their purpose in this world? To sell overpriced goods and eat tasty sausage? There's something very sinister in the underlying parts of the game involving these little freaks. I don't think I can fully trust them. Anyways, we continue our journey into the Urian Tunnel. Now, as someone who was really fond of this area in Xenoblade 2, going inside the Urian Titan and seeing the ruined parts of the previous environment within it was really cool and sad in a way. Things aren't the same anymore. But yeah, reference! For an RPG cave, it's a really fun place to explore. Some more interesting story things happen. We find what seems to be Yuni's former body and she remembers being killed by Mr. Wild Ride in the past. Damn. Promptly afterwards, we get attacked by Colony Ligma and Tyon's old commander who is now being controlled by another one of these clowns. And while fighting, we get some new Ouroboros forms. Hell yeah, brother. Cosmos. Mondo Man. Mondo and a hammer user from Monster Hunter. So it wasn't actually the commander, but a copy of him. And it turns out that this little freak was the friend that sacrificed himself to save lands when they were kids, but he's somehow alive again. Kind of a big reveal. I spat out my cereal. And he definitely doesn't seem as nice as last time, when everyone was just kids. So these freaks are people who've died, reincarnated into big meanies? Despite beating his ass, he walks away and he says toodles on his way out. And it pisses me off, goofy headass. 
This definitely leaves our cast of characters confused and curious about what really goes on behind the scenes in this world. At this point, I am loving everything the game is throwing at me and I am hella immersed. Video games are epic, man. Upvote. With each side quest I finish and cutscene I see, I'm more and more invested in this game. Chapter 4 starts off with showing off this badass dude named Calamari. I love this guy, even though they show him on screen for about 7 seconds. I wonder why his head is so high. Maybe he's been thinking too much. He needs to lie down. Relax a little. I quickly did the Commander Izzard's hero quest, and it's funny because they named his class Strategos like some sort of off-brand cereal. Mm. We're introduced to the Kevis Queen Melia in her goth Alchemoth castle, and apparently they have a laser beam cannon that can annihilate anything it points itself at. So our plans shift from heading to Sword March to going to Hollow Bastion instead. On our journey, we met Weed Cat. They're like Garfield if they smoked weed. But for real, they got the chillest colony. They don't care about dying. They talk about death and returning to the earth and becoming one with oblivion. Must be all that weed warping their mind. Lasagna. Also, I unlocked the ability to go down zip lines thanks to them. Field skills in this game are so good. Yippee! We're going through the woods now, and it's a mixture of Mortha from Xenoblade 2 and Machna Forest from Xenoblade 1, and it looks amazing. And it's a reference! But the coolest thing about this place by far is at the very, very bottom, near the Poison Lakes, there's a cave on the far end of the map. And if you go down far enough into this cave and solve its puzzles, a door opens that leads to a level 105 Super Boss Dragon. I noticed there was something beautiful behind him. But how did I defeat this Super Boss more than twice my level in hard mode? Well, I didn't. I noticed there was a climbable vine behind him, and in this game, if you climb a vine, it ends the combat immediately and despawns the enemy for a second. Just long enough for me to grab the precious item, and what do I find? The Legendary Biter, the weapon of the glorious hero upon Riki from Xenoblade 1. I was in awe. What an absolutely killer reference they stuck in this hard to get to area. I took the item and teleported my ass out of there before I became a pile of ashes. As a side note, at this point in the game, I've been doing so much side content that I am 20 levels above the story mission enemies. I'm built different right now. We're met with a cute emotional scene between Noah and Mio, and then we're thrown into a battle with Calamari and Ethel. They're being forced by the clown souls to kill us or die themselves. After a brief battle with their cool-ass mechs, they say, spark it and fight each other instead. The baddies don't like that, so they try to control Calamari, but he's so badass, he stabs himself in the eye to stop it from happening instead. God. Damn, this dude is the GOAT! Ethel and him decide if they're gonna die. They'll do it on their own terms, and fight to the death in a beautiful, touching scene, entrusting the future to us. Goodbye, my friends. The Clown Souls don't like this and reveal that we're not the only ones that can fuse, and they turn into their own freak of a fusion. God, they were disgusting to look at. They were talking some shit, but Neo had enough of them and punches this giant creature so hard they get sent flying. Where did she get this strength? This is some champion level Giga Gear 5 mode punch she somehow pulled off just because she was so pissed. Don't mess with cats, man. Lazanda. We fight them right after, and it was another insanely hype battle thanks to the tension in the story and the emphatic soundtrack. They were about to self destruct, but then Noah and Mio jump into the air and dual wield the god sword and cut this fella in half. This cutscene was absolute peak, and definitely the hypest one of the game so far. This game is so goddamn good, man, I'm glowing. In its hypest moments, it makes me feel such strong emotions. Ugh. Moving on, Mio pokes Noah in the forehead, and we march forward to goth Starbucks. In some side quest dialogue, I learned that Senna wants to become a Ferris, which is a big wolf in this game, making her a furry. Just thought that would be interesting information. We met Ashira, who was another badass character. She wants to die in glorious battle, if that helps you understand her better. She's messed up in the head, but she's cool. Definitely a personal favorite. We get to Kevis Castle now, and we gotta sneak through, or in my case, kill everything in my way until we reach the Annihilator. And when we do, who do we meet but Mr. Wild Ride themselves? Graf takes down his mask and turns out to be hot. Ooh. Damn, stupid sexy Graf. We fight him and Jay combined, funnily named Morbius DJ, and he starts cutting off our Ouroboros limbs in combat. Ouchie. Thankfully, they grow back eventually, but it still looks horrifying. Eventually, Yuni gets over her fear of seeing her past self die, and does an epic scheme to blow up Wild Ride and the Annihilator with him. The Annihilator explodes and goes bye-bye, but Mr. Wild Ride is still out there somewhere. As we try to escape, we run into the Queen of the Castle, and she wants us dead. Melia shoots some fireballs at us before she starts malfunctioning, and turns out to be a robot, 
this whole time. You're telling me the head honcho of this entire army is running on an Intel i5 core chip? N starts laughing like a maniacal goofball and gets ready to slice us all in half. But then the Van Dam Federation crashes the mobile artillery into the castle, steals some of the baby pods, and we get out scot-free. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie, a lot just happened in the last couple of minutes, but uh, hey, no more giant laser beams, yeah? The chapter starts off with us meeting up with the Van Dam goons, where we meet Monica Van Dam. Apparently, Vandam is a family name, because she's his daughter. Sorry about your dad, if you need it for sentimental value, a pile of his clothes are still laying around somewhere. They escort us to Sword March, where we've been trying to go for the last five chapters. We climb the sword as we overlook the world, and eventually inside the sword is this giant, beautifully designed city. Seriously, it was a breathtaking moment. This area was so unlike all the little colonies we've been in. It was mesmerizing. So, many insane scenes in the game happen here. For example, the gang learns what babies are since they had no concept of reproduction and romance, and Tyon freaks the fuck out touching this baby. And honestly, I'd animate this, but the scene itself is too funny to pass up, so here you go. <laughs> Alright then, lads and lasses. Who wants to know how babies are made? What the hell? Later on, we learn about the founders of the city, which has some really cool references to the older games. It looks like Shulk, Rex, Numa were involved, and Fei Fong Wong from Xenogears. And apparently in this game, he is the founder of the Van Damme clan. I have no idea what any of this means in the grand scope of things, but I'll take the references and happily go along with my day. But yeah, overall, cool place. I can't believe the crew learned about cock, balls, dick, and coochie today. I did a quest where we literally watched vegetables grow for an hour. But I'm not kidding. Monica Van Dam joins a team for real now as a hero. Shortly after that was one of the best moments of my life. Boat ride. Boat ride. Boat ride. Boat ride. This is one of my favorite parts of the game so far. Being able to explore this wide expanse of sea filled with islands makes me feel like I'm a little goober playing Wind Waker again. I end up spending countless hours exploring the Erythia Sea. One of my first stops is an island where I meet Fiona. It was kind of sad, we just walked around as we saw all of her dead friends from battle, and she just sat there and cried at each pile of her comrades. The next thing I witnessed was an incredible moment for me. There in a bed of flowers on a cliff overlooking the edge of the world was Goo Goo, a little pink and white no pond. Why is this so significant? Okay, not to be an ego Eric right now, but there's a good chance there might be a little fly head in the localization team because in our playthrough of Xenogears, we named the adorable pink and white party member Choo Choo Goo Goo in the game. And maybe, just maybe, this may be a little piece of fly crew history or a simple coincidence that makes me look like a dumbass. Either way, I love Goo Goo. We finish up Fiona's <laughs> quest where more of her friends die and she cries, but she's on our team now. Yippee! She gives buffs to everyone and is busted, a great help and boost in this hard mode run. And perhaps one day, she can stop sobbing. On our journey in the ocean, we met a man of the sea, Captain Goddamn Triton. A console who doesn't give a shit, goes fishing and is an absolute badass. I had to prove myself by doing a couple of trials, one of them being literally called a quest for booty. I had to search for booty in a Xenoblade game. It didn't take Dang. long. Uh, we got our more party member, and he has by far the most unique hero class. Basically, the more unique monsters you kill, the more arts and skills obtained, and the stronger you get. Unfortunately, it didn't count for the ones I already killed, so I spent the next two hours going back and refighting them all. I'm sorry, little sea otter. Uh, now, I figured it was time to progress the story as long as I had every side quest done. Once I finish all the side quests, I'm gonna head to the prison and save Gondor once I've done every single one. So I get to it, and just when I think every quest symbol on the map is gone, another one shows up. So I finish it, and three more popped up. I finish that, and seven more pop up. This goes on for hours, days. After countless ascension quests, side quests, and miscellaneous tomfoolery, I am finally ready to head to this damn prison. Prison Island. I didn't realize at the time that this little prison would lead to some of the craziest and emotional scenes this game had to offer. The gang sneaks into the prison pretending to be prisoners. The guards for some reason think oh this God. is nothing out of the ordinary and welcomes us in as some new inmates that are volunteering for indentured servitude. We meet Gondor who calls her mom Monica the bitch queen for some reason. She jumps and dive kicks our party. After our skirmish we become buds and hatch a plan to pretend to be a prisoner for three days to buy time to plot our escape. For having someone in our party that's gonna die in under a month, our cast of characters in general is really chill with burning time with side quests and the like. 
Seriously, we don't give a spark about our dwindling lifespan sometimes. I mean, cats do have nine lives. The day finally comes, and as we escape the prison, we get betrayed by Shania, who's apparently been lurking the entire game. Gondor wasn't so nice to her, and she hasn't had the best life, and she keeps failing, so she's like, you know what? I'm just gonna die and get reborn now, and maybe I'll be less cringe in the next life. Honestly, I kinda get it, but damn, this kinda pissed me off. Like, where did her goofy ass even come from? M and N show up ready to ambush us, and M decides to fight us herself. She's just some conqueror's hockey and begins the fight where we find out she can actually possess us one at a time to fight each other. This was actually terrifying during the battle itself because my overpowered strong-ass party members would just one-shot everybody on my team when she used this ability. It took me four tries to beat her and she was like 25 levels under me. Anyways, we defeat her but N steps in for real for the first time and he absolutely unequivocally slices the shit out of every one of us. We get decimated, laying on the floor looking like a bunch of snuffin' buffoons. Before N slices Noah in half, he decides, you know what, I'm actually gonna keep y'all alive for some entertainment. What kind of entertainment? Stick us in prison for the remainder of Mio's life, and then execute her at the eclipse while everyone watches. Jeez, dude. What proceeds is an emotional scene where beautiful music is playing, while a party tries futile attempts to bust their way out of their cell. It's a really touching scene. Noah's kicking the ever-snuffing fucking spark out of the jail door, punching it, refusing hamburgers from Manana. He's going through it. To make this depressing scene feel even more sad and hopeless, Mio admits her love to Noah, and by the way, says his name for the first time, and never realized that she never said it once. Apparently, because she knew if she said it, she'd admit her feelings, and she knew she didn't have much time left, so... Anyways, <laughs> Noah is a pile of tears right now. The fated moment arrives. The entire squad is lined up to be executed, kind of like this image of Shadow the Hedgehog. And there she is, during the eclipse, it's a much more toned down situation than the Eclipse in Berserk, but don't worry about that. Mio is brought up to the front to be sent for homecoming. Something important to note is that anyone who is sent this way cannot be reborn. Anne walks up to Noah and drops down Noah's flute. You're an offseer, he says, so go on and send her. I could not believe the audacity of this man. He already went through hell in that jail cell, and to put salt on the wounds like this? What a crazy snuffin' freak. Just when we think Noah could muster up something to go save her, we see Mio disappearing in this horribly sad scene. She thanks Noah for the good times and dies. I couldn't believe it. They actually killed her off. She knew all my passwords to my offshore bank accounts, god damn it. As Noah sobs, <laughs> N prepares to chop his damn head off, which brings us to... I can't find a way to properly explain what just happened here, so I'm going to refer you guys to the Flytuber to give you a brief summary of the events that unfolded. Okay, so basically we're in this dream realm where Noah sees what happened to him in his past life, which is also the past lives of N, uh, because Noah and N are the same, okay? And Mio and M are also the same. So basically we find out in the past lives, Mio kept dying over and over, so Zed gave N an impossible choice in order to keep Mio alive. So he took the choice, but in order for it to happen, he had to kill all the people in the city that he loves, so he's a bad guy, but not really because he was kind of forced into it, and it was all kind of Zed's fault. Anyways, the Mio that got sent and died was actually M, and M swapped bodies uh, with uh, Mio when she did the Conqueror hockey before and so this new Mio fused with M's body who's both Orboros and Morbius now stops N from chopping Noah's uh, head off and reveals to him that he killed the wrong cat girl because they swap bodies and N is absolutely devastated. Okay back to the animation. I gotta go to my uh, palace now. This is Loki the least complicated plot in a Xeno game by the way. Anyways Boom. N is devastated. Despite being a smug arsehole earlier he is utterly crushed. Mio explains M wanted to die because living with N sucks ass and he just wasn't the same anymore. Meanwhile, Shania is like, well, spark this, I'm gonna blow up your city, and fires up the Annihilator and destroys the city. Well, that's what we thought until we realized the city is actually a Faronis and escaped into the ocean and it's fine. Shania said, fuck uh. it, I'm gonna respawn anyways, and shoots herself in the head. R.I.P. Bozo. Okay, this has definitely been the most eventful string of cutscenes by far. I gotta say, I like how this game isn't afraid to explore some dark topics, and also it was very satisfying to see N go from this <laughs> to that. I can't lie, man, this game knows how to keep me hooked. After processing everything that transpired, and choosing whether or not to have Mio keep long or short hair, I picked long because I've seen her with short hair for 120 hours already and I wanted to mix things up. Our next goal is to find Zed and beat his ass for being evil and being the mastermind behind all this nonsense. 
Once again, I sink a spark ton of time into the side quest in this game, the highlight of it being Captain Triton navigating us around the world to find an ancient pot of miso so mm -hmm. we can learn to make miso soup. I'm going to go into why this is more ridiculous than it already is later in this video. Uh, we sidetrack and go to Mio's old colony, where we find out that Miyabi, her old pal, is still alive, along with Calamari. He's back and somehow a grown-ass man again? The hell? Oh, and one more person is alive again. Mwamba. Mwamba is alive. Oh my god. My prayers have been answered by the heavens. So apparently Console Y played God and somehow brought them back close to the end of their lives because he's a little quirky. So of course we gotta swoop in and save them from the evil brainwashing they were under. Y teleports away and Miyabi and Calamari join us in our squad. However, Mwamba doesn't join us or in fact remember us at all, which is definitely a little sad. Even though our friend is back to life in a way, he's still a lifeless husk. But he's alive, baby! Yahoo! We meet Sagiri, which is a girl who speaks like a robot that pilots a cool-looking Feronis. And now I have every hero character in the base game, which is a nice feeling of accomplishment. Now, maxing out every class on every character is going to be the hard part. Speaking of classes, baby Ethel escapes her fetus pod, and we put her in the growing pod, and she's the same as she was before now. This is incredibly convenient. After our little side quest detour, we head to the Cloud Keep to meet with the Queen of Agnes. The castle revealed itself to us, and they played some pretty Xenoblade 2 music. It was really nice. After climbing up to the top of the castle, we find the Queen's Cat Preservation Pod. And there we see her, for real for the first time in the game, was Queen Mia. It was surreal seeing her like this in this game. And right before we get a chance to talk to her, she gets pierced and shot through the heart by Mr. Wildride. I cannot make this shit up. She didn't even get a chance to say a word. Shout out to this game for giving me a hearty chuckle from that. This game is just full of surprises. Well, we take care of Team D and J, and we have a heartfelt moment with our old pal Yorin. We give him a classic main character speech, and he sees the error of his ways and saves us one last time, with a badass explosion taking both him and Mr. Wild right out. Rest in peace to the goats. Oh, and it turns out Nia didn't actually die. Since she's a blade, I guess if her core crystal doesn't get pierced, she's okay. That's great and everything, but honestly, if they kept her dead from being shot that way, that would have been so goddamn funny. We talked to her, and she's kind of a little goofball putting up a royal front. It was nice to see her personality not change too much. In a cutscene, we see the real Queen Melia, and we see how they both plan to put their world's information and knowledge in origin, and they also talked between planets through light. Uh, it's complicated, but basically they were preparing for the inevitable world merge, and were planning to wake up when the time was right. When the world was merging, Z showed up and froze the worlds, and we are stuck in the endless now and the cycle of death we're currently in. Don't worry about it. Also, it turns out Team Morbius is keeping Melia locked up in Origin, so we gotta go save her before taking care of Zed. And apparently, Tora helped build the Origin. Now, if that is why Origin has a big Zenusi we gotta enter into to make our way to the core, I'll leave up to your interpretation. But yeah, we're on our final mission for real. But first, a couple of filler quests. We gotta get our metal detectors to collect parts for our boat upgrade so we can actually enter the storm the origin lies within. Also, we meet Noah's old friend Chris, who's now a Morbius. He dies and Noah learns a lesson. You know the formula by now. Okay, now it is time to enter origin and beat the game. But how could I possibly do that without doing every piece of side content this game has to offer, along with maxing out everything I possibly could before the credits roll? I got every character's classes maxed out to level 20, maxing out the affinity with every single colony, upgraded my blades with the hidden origin shards, and of course got all my characters to level 99, which actually wasn't all that hard to do in this game. I finished all ascension quests and side quests as well, a lot of interesting moments happened that I'll now go over. Uh, Shania came back as a Morbius, surprise surprise, she attacked the city AGAIN. God, when will she learn? Gondor does the sickest punch to crush her core crystal and kills her ass. Turns out Shania was good at art, which completely explains to me why she was depressed. Anyways, she dies and never gets her wish to be reborn and try again, but I guess she was okay with her life in the end. She got killed by someone named Gondor, though. L. Dang. We do a cooking competition with Miyabi, and I'm introduced to the funniest dialogue in the game. <laughs> Monica cooks a curry and calls it Monacurry. 
Insane. Genius. Speaking of cooking, I find out 150 hours into my playthrough that currently as of patch 1.1, the cooking in this game doesn't work whatsoever. I mean at all. None of the stat buffs apply. They forgot to code it in. Which means this little freak is a fraud. Despite making her cooking the one and only thing about her personality, none of it fed us any sort of nutrients whatsoever. I am losing all my faith in Nopon. I really am. It was time to take on the super bosses in the game. Just kind of like a quest line. We gotta beat a bunch of them to unlock the final one. With the power of Noah's unlimited sword, coupled with the skill capable hands that lets me use it at the beginning of the fight without having to build it up, it has led me to crush anything in my way, super bosses and all, in hard mode. Seriously, pulling out the lucky seven feels like god mode. After taking down the super bosses, the dragon from earlier included, the final super boss spawns, and it gets his own voice cutscene and one of the sickest fight themes in the game. Anyways, I destroy the shit out of him and prepare for the final stage of the game. And as a side note, with killing the last super boss, that marked me completing my soul hacker class. All unique monsters are defeated now, baby. Now I have so many places to quick travel to. It's actually insane how much content is in this game. Trying to complete everything was a big challenge. Just when I thought I had completed every quest for an area, another 7 would pop up that would lead to another 12 quests in another area that would unlock a new area that would unlock another 20 quests and... Well, you get the point. But this game is like an overwhelming sea of content and after 170 hours of doing all of this, I think I had enough. Which is good because for real, no capping, I am heading to the final dungeon. Yeah. Real. After dodging its disco light laser beams, we go through the Zenusi and are inside Origin, which is cool, badass, and purple. This area is huge and honestly, I couldn't tell most of it apart. But I soldiered through and I eventually found where Queen Melia was being kept, propped up like she was Goo Goo from Xenogears. In order to free her, we had to get through N, who's back with extra angst. After a climactic showdown, N finally sees the light and believes we can truly change the world. He ends up fusing with Noah, and now Noah is more a Boros just like Mio. And we also unlock the final move for Unlimited Sword. Thanks, N. We talk to Melia for real, and it feels like she isn't much different than herself from previous games. It is still surreal hearing these characters again in Xenoblade 3. She explains apparently that Zed isn't a dude, but is a concept, and we gotta take him down to change this world. Will do, Melia. She and Riku nod at each other before she teleports away, which begs me to ask this question again. Who is Riku, and what does he know? He is so suspicious, man. We take down X for good, she's dead, we take down Y, he's dead, and it dawns me that we fight X and Y because it's before Z. Takahashi, you've done it again. It's time to fight the last boss. Zed welcomes us into the amphitheater inside Origin, where all of his spooky cutscenes took place throughout the game. He summons his own audience. What a goddamn loser. What follows suit in classic JRPG fashion is a 13-phase fight with unskippable cutscenes, and if you die in any phase, you are sent to the title screen, only to repeat this folly again and again. Truly the endless now. After learning the power of friendship, Zed reveals his true form, which is being a giant floating Andros-like head with a spooky voice. Origin changes from a ball to this cool body-like form with tentacles. Nia and Melia help out from above by transforming their castles into mechs and firing lasers. Badass. After about 47 phases, Nia and Melia actually join in on the fight in person, which is sick. They show off their new designs and abilities, and it's a great way to finish off the floating headman. Zed is nearly defeated. M and N reveal they weren't totally dead and gone and use their powers to kill Zed for good. But now they'll be totally dead and gone anyways and won't get to live in the new world about to be created. Zed screams and then dies. See ya, Boza. Everything flashes white. In front of us, we see our old worlds. In a short moment's time, everyone from Kevis will go back to their old world and from Agnes to theirs. So, unfortunately, our party will be separated very soon. It's a sad moment. Noah and Mio smooch each other, Lans and Senna get loud with each other, and Tyon gives Uni some dried herbs to smoke. Beautiful. Noah yeets his weapon off a cliff. He don't need that snuff anymore. They start playing the pretty Xenoblade music, and Melia shows off Shulk's old sword. I wonder what Nia's gonna show us. Oh yes, this image! What the fuck? Wait, this brings us back to rule number five of the Salvager's Code. Get laid without a condom, and you could get yourself messed up. This game is truly beautiful. Our cast says their goodbyes, and the world starts splitting apart. In a touching scene, they run after each other, even though they're getting pulled farther and farther away. Someday, they might see each other again. 
At least they were successful in changing the world and finding out who they were deep inside. And that, everyone, is the end of Xenoblade Chronicles 3. A beautiful game from start to finish. 200 hours later, I gotta say, overall, my experience with it is that it's the best game in the series to date, regardless of all its tomfoolery. I will say, though, I am disappointed we didn't end up finding the Xenoblade. Hey, maybe in Xenoblade 4, though, huh? Hope you enjoyed the video. It was really fun to make. If you did, please subscribe. The, the best way to support me is to catch me on Twitch, where I'm doing my first playthrough of Persona 5 for the next video. Okay, bye!